Very good question. So um, today, so let's recall last time. What we did last time. So last time we saw um, previously. We saw an application of Dewar theorem. We were actually just using um, a corollary of, of um, Dewar theorem saying that for any pole set P with, um, so let's from now on just think of pole sets where we only cared about transitivity and anti-symmetric um, and we don't care about these uh, reflexive, re reflexivity, uh, reflexivity. So if you have any pole set on n elements, ground set P is of size n, let's say, then the corollary of the Dilworth theorem is saying that the height of these pole sets, which is the length of the, the size of longest chain and times the width of the pole sets, which is the size of the largest anti chain, is at least um, size of the ground set of this pole set N, uh, P. And we use it with with um, application is better Ram Z. Here by better, I mean better than the generic logarithmic bound for generic graphs. We got the polynomial in M bound, better Ramsey for interval graphs and um, intersection graphs. Of planar convex sets. We've remarked that for planar convex sets, we we, stu we still get the polynomial size bound on the subcollection of planar convex sets that are either pairwise destroying or pairwise intersecting, which corresponds to a uh, clique or independent sets in its intersection graph. And we remark that this is not true anymore if you look at convex bodies in three dimension or above, because every graph uh, can be represented as the intersection graph of convex sets in three dimension already. So um, not no better Ramsey or intersection graph of convex sets in R3. That means what? So this, um, as I said, we should always try to think what would be interesting to do if one n is dead. Um, going higher dimension for general convex sets is dead. But still, there can we look at more restrictions, a more uh, special family of convex sets in higher dimension? It turns out a natural one does have a better Ramsey, which is the axis aligned rec uh, boxes. Um, but or special convex sets in high dimension. But, but for special convex sets, we do still have um, we can prove Better Ramsey. 
And here, let's consider so-called axis parallel or axis aligned boxes in RD. So I'll skip writing the precise definition. Um, I'll just draw pictures. In one dimension, it's very simple. It's nothing but intervals. In two dimension, um, R2, we are looking for rectangles, but not any rectangles like these. So this is not okay. We are looking for axis parallel, axis aligned boxes. So this is fine because the size of this rectangle is parallel to the x and y axis, okay? So this is also okay. In three dimension, let me draw one more. Uh, so you get the idea. The, in RD, in general, you have a uh, axis parallel boxes. If the sides, if the facets of this, if the size of these boxes is parallel to, um, to the plane, okay? Uh, so here, how do I draw it? Uh, so if you draw something tilted like this, that would be bad, all right? We want something parallel to the box. So you can draw like this. Okay. So this one parallel to here. Maybe, yeah, yeah, this is a parallel. And um, where's parallel? And which color I haven't used? Purple. It's purple, right? For this shape, we have better Ramsey. Um, let me write down the best bound. So the best bound now for three dimension and above, there's a very, for all dimension, actually there's just a log log term gap. So the gap is very small, yet there is a gap. So if we define for, let's define, um, Rn or should we say Bn for B stands for boxes is the maximal um, number M such that for any N uh, boxes I will skip writing axis aligned this will be assumed uh, for any N boxes in RD, there exist M of them that are um, either pairwise intersecting or pairwise disjoint. Okay? In other words, if you look at the intersection graph of M boxes, so in intersection graph, G, this is basically click, and this is basically, oops, independent sets. We have a. Uh, um, this will be the Ramsey number for this intersection graph of boxes. Okay, for this, the current best bound in all RD is due to 
H to one to mon. Very recently, um, he proved that for boxes, these are. I should put this dimension D somewhere. No, yeah. B and D. So D is the dimension. So B and D is at most um, big O of square root N times this. How do I write it? Log N, log log N over log N raised to the power D minus two over two. And at least um, also square root N, <clears throat> Big omega square root n times um, log log n over log n to the d minus 2 over 2. So it's very close. You see, the main term look the same. It's only off by the log log n term power is different. So for R2, let's just look at rectangles, axis parallel rectangles in the plane. This vanish, right? D equal to two, this is zero here. So this disappear, we have upper bound square root N, we have a lower bound, this also disappear. Um, uh, this log N should be down here, sorry. So let me write it again. Okay, uh, for the lower bound, this also disappear. You have square root n over log log n. So today we're going to prove using, yeah, uh, we will see how we use the old theorem again to prove a slightly weaker bound with log n at the bottom rather than log log n. So in particular, um, it will be an interesting open question for two dimension for rectangles axis parallel rectangles in the plan, um, can we close the gap? This is Bn2, square root n, um, omega, square root n over log log n. We are almost there, but not there. So let's prove the weaker bound. This weaker bound is still due to the four people. Um, Larman, um, Matushek, Janos Pach, and Torosik. For axis parallel boxes in the plan, we have B N two is at least n over log n, a square root n over log. Um, let me. Okay, we're going to prove this bound. Any question about the statement? No, good. So, um, so let's write down these statements in words, what it means. In other words, for any N rectangles, axis aligned, um, rectangles in the plan are two, we can always find um, there are there exist 
square root n over log n, meaning of them. Um, that are pairwise intersecting or disjoint. So this is a, a short, nice proof, but contains some very nice uh, tricks, some methods. So the idea, we will use, uh, it's very short, but contains nice three nice ingredients. One is we're gonna use Dilworth. Um, and we, we will use induction that we've seen being very useful. Um, induction on N, induction. And third thing, very important technique, especially in um, computational geometry, uh, also in algorithmic problems in graph theory, is divide and conquer. So-called divide and conquer. So let me say briefly a few words. Divide and conquer basically says if you have an object that's um, massive to analyze, but if you have a good way of dividing it into smaller pieces, let's say two parts, roughly same size, um, or of constant factor of each other, the size is comparable, then um, if the cost of cutting them is cheap, we can then cut them into two pieces and just analyze each part. And here you can use induction to analyze, right? Then somehow you piece together the solution of two parts and try to um, solve the problem. Maybe this part is also large, then you further cut it into pieces and further cut it into pieces, uh, if that's possible. That's that's how we call divide. That's why it's called divide and conquer. We divide into smaller pieces, and we conquer conquer this whole massive monster piece by piece. Okay. Yeah. And how we deal with smaller pieces usually using induction. That's the idea. So let's see how we carry out this strategy. Again, we need to define some whole set structure so that we can use Dilworth. So um, let's draw some pictures. We have, now we are working on the plane. Yeah, I, I was moved the screen down. Let's remember this statement. We need to prove roughly square root n up to polylog that pairwise intersecting or disjoint. We will prove using induction that suffices to prove that for any natural number k and for any um, n equal to k times 2 to the k um, boxes, rectangles, there exist um, for any, then, yeah, let me define this. Let G be the intersection graph of, um, is M rectangles. That means each rectangle is a vertex and two are adjacent if the two rectangles has non-empty intersection. Then we're gonna prove um, for any N equal to 
k times two to the k, then um, the click number of this intersection graph times the independent number of this intersection graph of boxes is at least two to the k. All right, why is this enough? Because the click correspond to pairwise intersecting boxes and independent sets correspond to pairwise disjoint boxes, rectangles. If this is true, then that means one of them, which will be the one we want, both of them are the one we want, one of them will be at least um, square root of this guy, right? But what is this guy? If n is k2 to the k, then this is roughly, let me write it in the parenthesis, this is roughly, this is roughly n over log n. Then that means one of them will be at least square root of this guy, which is square root of n over log n. That's the one we want. All right, so we just need to prove this statement. You may say that we only prove n of some specific form, but between uh, two numbers of this form, you can always fill it up by adding um, dummy points, dummy boxes that has nothing to do with uh, just Just don't consider them. To make n of this form, you will just change this bound by a constant factor. It wouldn't matter. Okay, so let me write one word about it. Um, yeah, I will not write it. So we can always move n to the next, if it's not of this form, to the next one of this form. Um, you The resulting bound will only be probably a factor of two or three words. And we only care about order of magnitude, so it's not. Uh, it's not going to be uh, essential for us. So this is now our goal. We would use induction on K. Base case, K equal to 1. If K equal to 1, N equals to 1 times 2 to the 1 equals to 2. And 2 to the K equals to 2 as well. So what does it say? For any intersection graph of boxes with two vertices, either there's a clique of size two, which is an edge, or independent set of size two, which is just no edge. That's trivial. For any graph on two vertices, we have one of these two scenario. So let's look at the inductive step. Now let me draw this picture to illustrate this divide and conquer strategy. Let me not draw the y-axis. It's not very useful. So we have these boxes. Um, let's draw them. Maybe it looks like this. Let me draw a special guy here. Okay, I draw lots of boxes. Suppose these are the n rectangles in the plane that we consider, and we are dealing with inductive step, right? So let me first say the idea. The idea is we look at um, we look at the box, and the special box will be this one. Let me draw it with red color. This is special because it's kind of right in the sort of middle in some sense. 
uh, how do we say they're how do we say they're ordering by small perturbation we may assume they're right the largest x coordinate of theirs is vertical line on their right side they are all distinct by small perturbation this we can assume we can move the boxes shake it a little bit without changing their intersection pattern pairwise intersection pattern and we can make sure that all these right vertical line of each boxes are distinct now they are distinct we can give them an ordering by this x coordinates and we grab out one um, that's sort of in the middle now we look at now we draw this line corresponding line of these boxes we take out a sub collection of the boxes which are those intersecting this pink line this line which is the right hand side of this sort of middle box and then here they are into these boxes they are intersecting if and only if their projection on this line are intersecting which means it becomes an interval graph now we can then just invoke our results for interval graph you always have square root n independent sets or uh clique which is better stronger than what we need we just need square root n over log n so we are done if there are many boxes intersecting this line that means we, we may assume there are very few boxes intersecting this line otherwise we are done but then that's good that means we have a very economic cheap way of cutting of to do this divide and conquer we can divide the boxes into the left part and right parts and discard those we forget about those the intersecting this line there are not so many of them anyway otherwise we would have we would have been done using the results on interval graph then we use induction hypothesis on each side to get that there are many intersecting or disjoint then we somehow piece them together and piecing them together is not so hard all we need to notice is that the click number of this graph is the maximum click number of the left and the right independence number is at least the independence set here plus an independence set here if they disjoin here and disjoin here we can merge them to become a whole disjoint family so let's write down this idea in details um as i said by small perturbation by perturbing the rectangles if necessary we may assume all right vertical line all right vertical segments of them um all vertical line So here, when you write the note, you should write it more precise. You should say all the lines containing the right vertical segments. So all right vertical lines, I put a quotation here, of them are distinct. All right, which then naturally give an ordering of, of these rectangles by this right vertical line. Now we look at, now we consider um, the um, uh, M, did I use M before? Consider the Mth, I mean, not right, just write K minus one um, times two to the K minus one, a uh, rectangle in this ordering
which is this red one here. Okay. And let this line call it L. Now we let um, R zero be the be the collection be the sub collection set of all rectangles intersecting the line L, which is the k minus one times two to the k minus one line. Uh, rectangle, All right? Now let me copy this picture. I will use it again. Hmm. So now we first deal with the rectangles in R0, two rectangles in R0 are intersecting. We're gonna reduce the dimension, okay? Are intersecting if and only if their projection on L all intersecting. Then we get the interval graph. Interval graph for R0, right? For the collection of rectangles, we obtain, you look at this. So this will be for this one, and this interval will be for this one. This will be for this one. This will be for this one, so on and so forth. We have an interval graph. Okay? And what do we know about interval graph? If you have t vertices, you have square root t, clique square root t, uh, independent set. So if R0, oops, if, uh, or in other words, the omega of this intersection graph of R0, let's call it G0, if there are two to the k rectangles intersecting L in R0, we are done. Yeah. Let's call this graph G0. So if R0 is at least two to the k, we get that little omega of G, oops, times alpha of g is at least omega of g0, the interval graph corresponding to r0, projection of r0, is at least r0, at least two to the k. We will be happy and we can go home. Um, so we may assume r0 is small. Then we do divide and conquer, use induction on each side. So we may assume R0 is less than 2 to the k. Then we let R1 be the set of rectangles that whose right vertical line is uh, at most that of L, including this red, red rectangle, all the things to the left of it, this is R1. to the left of the line L. In other words, we have this ordering, remember? And this is the K minus one, two K minus one. It just means the first 
k minus one, two k minus one uh, rectangles in the above ordering. Okay, so we have by definition, this is k minus one, two k minus one, and let r two to be r minus r zero r one. So we have r one r two here. Now r two, what's the size? Equals two. We have n rectangles in total. Minus R0 is uh, R1 is equals to this size. R0 is less than 2 to the k. So this is strictly bigger. 2 to the k. Uh, what is this? But what is n? n is k times 2 to the k, right? Yeah, let's write it. k times 2 to the k. So this guy minus this is k minus 1 times 2 to the k, which is 2 times this guy. So minus itself, minus this one equals to this one itself. This equals to just computation, this one, all right? So we cut the rectangles into the left and right, each one of which has size at least k minus 1 times 2 to the k minus 1. Looks familiar. This format we can use induction, inductive induction hypothesis for a k minus one. So induction hypothesis implies that if you define gi, we forgot to define gi is the intersection graph for uh, R i, all right, i is one or two. Then we have uh, g i, alpha g i for each i is at least two to the k minus one. Now we're gonna piece them together, okay. So how do we piece them together? We need to get the lower bound on this original graph. Okay. For the clique, we have to compare this with omega g1, omega g2, and alpha with alpha g1, alpha g2. Alpha is easy. If you have an independent set here, which are pairwise destroying rectangles, and you have an independent set here in G2, which are pairwise disjoint rectangles. They are separated by this line L. That means you can merge them together. You get a large, you still, you merge these two. They are still a collection of pairwise disjoint rectangles. In other words, note that Alpha G is at least alpha G1 plus alpha G2. You can merge rectangle uh, destroying collection on the left and right to get a destroying collection. And trivially, we have this is at least, trivially, at least the max of each one of them. max of one. If you have a pairwise intersecting here, pairwise intersecting here, just take the larger one. Yeah, this is trivial. So that's enough for us to finish the proof. This is at least um, the max of, of omega gi times alpha g is at least alpha G1 plus 
alpha G2. Then you multiply this in there, it will be at least, so this multiplied by this will be at least alpha G1 times omega G1. Omega G1 will be at most these, right? So it will be omega G1, alpha G1, plus omega G2, similarly, times alpha G2. Um, but we know induction hypothesis, merge them together, two to the K, done. <clears throat> Any question? So let me mention um, a very related conjecture, which is still open to this Ramsey type results for rectangles. Just in the plane, we can define um, We can also view these rectangles as uh, hypergraphs. And I'm gonna mention, wait a second. Let me mention a related conjecture. A related conjecture of Galfarsh and Lehel. which is still open. Uh, so to formulize their conjecture, uh, we will not view this collection of boxes in terms of their intersection graph, but we look at them as hypergraphs. How do we look at them as, as hypergraphs? Um, just imagine uh, these boxes are hyper edges. And the vertex sets, whatever, you have infinitely many points. So the you know, all these points are vertices of these boxes. So you forget about, you don't care about uh, vertices. Vertices are just points, right? You have these hyper edges, which are the rectangles. Now you cared about for a hypergraph, it's transversal number and matching number. Have I defined this in this course? I haven't defined hypergraphs, have I? or set system. So let me define it. We're gonna view rectangles or axis parallel boxes as set systems or hypergraphs where each um, the rectangle or box is a set in this set system or is a hyper edge in the hypergraph. Same thing, different language, all right? Then for a hypergraph, we can, uh, for a set system, We can define for a set system, let's say two to the X. This X is the ground set. X could be infinite. In this case, it's infinite. It's all the points in the plane. Okay. Um, the We can define its transversal number the first okay let me define um a set of 
points T, which is a subset of point grounds at X, is a transversal. of f if it intersects all the sets in the subsystem f if for any f in f um, t intersect f is now empty that's a transversal and it's the transversal number transversal number tau of f which denoted by tau of f is the size of the smallest transversal of f is the size of smallest transversal of f. Here's an example. Well, I'm going to draw two examples. One is a set system on bounding number of points. So let's say this is finite example, finite uh, x. Let's say x equal to five. We have five vertices. And your uh, sets are this guy, this guy, and Let me draw a little bit more, shall we? Um, Let me see. Okay, let, let's just do this one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we have seven vertices, this bounded. And um, this is a set system on seven vertices, so hypergraph on seven, vert seven points <laughs> with uh, four sets, four hyper edges. What will be the transversal number? That means we need to find a set of points that peers intersect, capture all the hyper edges, all the sets. So of course you can take here, 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 these four vertices, then all edges intersect them. But that's not the best. The best I believe is you take this vertex, which kills dun dun dun, and there's one more, right? Let's take one more. Probably two is the best. You cannot do with one. So let's highlight it. Here, the transversal will be, you take this point and this point. Tau F1 equals to two. Here is F1. Yeah. Um, let me also define let new of F be its matching number. So we define set system, the matching number, the same as graph. In the graph, what's a matching number? It's the size of largest uh, uh, matching, which is pairwise disjoint edges. So here in the set system or hypergraph, we care about pairwise disjoint sets or hyper edges, which is the size of largest pairwise disjoint sets. So in this example, and trivially, this is proposition, or maybe you cannot even call it a proposition. For any hypergraph, for any set system, the transversal number is at least matching number. Why? Because if you have disjoint sets, 
in your set system, then to hit to hit all these edges, you need to choose a vertex from each one. They are disjoint. So the points you pick has to be at least a number of sets in this matching. So this is trivial. In this first example of bounded ground sets, these two numbers are the same because I can take which matching. I can take um, this edge and this edge. This is a matching of size two, right? Let me draw another example with infinite ground sets. X is R2, all the points in R2. Another example. And this um, will be right. So let me see, how do I? I want to design an example where the rectangle is the matching number is strictly less than tau. Okay, this is not always equality. In this special case, it happens to be equality. So how do I design this? Uh, let's do it together. <coughs> I need one that you need many, many points to pierce them. Uh, ah, okay. I can do a cheap one. This feels like cheating. Uh, wh what's the example? I draw like this. You probably get wh what I'm doing. So this is actually, what I'm trying to do is to draw a C5. Right, this is like a C5. So let's see. We have a set system with infinitely many points. And um, the sets or hyper edges are these five rectangles. What's the matching number? The matching number is two, right? No matter how you choose three, you will get two that run into each other, I believe. So there's no way of choosing um three which is also clear if you draw this c5 intersection graph so new of this is called f2 is two whereas tau of f2 is um so tau let's point out this we need at least three points. You cannot do it with four points because why? We have five sets. Yeah. No matter what point you take, it only appears at most two rectangles. There's no three rectangle sharing a common point. So that means you pick one, you kill two, you pick one, you kill two. There's still one left. You need at least three points. So let's pick one, it kills these two. Let's pick uh, this one and this one. You'll kill everything, all right? Good. So the conjecture of Gelfash and Lehel is that we don't look at the intersection graph of rectangles, rather we look at inter we look at set system of rectangles and compare the transversal number and its matching number. We've seen an example here that this could be strict in inequality. Um, what Gelfash and Leho is conjecture is that this inequality uh, we can use we have a we can have an inverse inequality where we can use a function of new to upper bound tau, and the function they're proposing is a is a linear function. So you have some constant new of f is at least this. 
This is not always true, leaves linear upper bound. Try to think of a counterexample. The gap could be any function, at least exponential function. I have to think a little bit, all right? But for these rectangles, they conjecture that linear function is enough. So let me write it down. They say that um, the for any R collection of rectangles, X is parallel rectangles in R2, um, the transversal number of R is bounded by a linear function of its matching number. This is open. What's the best known bound? The best known bounds is is probably again. Um, so let's first see. Let me uh, before I say the best known bound. Let's first see a consequence of this conjecture. The consequence is that um, the consequence is that if you look at uh, G, the intersection graph of R, and let's do some correspondence. What's the matching number of this rectangle? Matching number is just pairwise disjoint rectangles, which is maximum size, which is the independence number of G. And what about Um, transversal number. Transversal number is the minimum number of points that pierce all rectangles. That means all the rectangles correspond to vertices in this graph. And each point peers through this one. So this form a clique, this form a clique, this form a clique, which is the minimum number of parts we can partition the graph G into clicks. This is the minimal number of clicks, disjoint clicks, covering V of G, right? So that means what? This means um, the click number of G is at least N over tau of R, right? Because if you have K clicks can cover all the vertices, K clicks, then one of the click must be at least N over K just by pigeonhole, which is at most the click number. So if GL is true, it will imply that the click number times independence number of G is at least, remember, this is at least this one, N over transversal number of R, and alpha is just nu of R, right? And if this is at most a linear of that, that means this fraction, nu over tau, is omega one, is at least some constant. which then will imply that at least one of them square root n. Before we have, remember, our gap here, we get the square root n Ramsey bound. Let's look at this open problem here. We can then get rid of this log log n factor. So this, what I'm saying is, Gelfash Leihel's conjecture is stronger than this one here, closing the gap.
Any question? There's also a higher dimension one. So the so far the best known bound is still due to each to one to mom. Best bound in the same paper. Um, I will just write it in all dimension in RD, the boxes. You view boxes as a set system, then the transversal number of these boxes B is at most linear in new. So let me skip writing B, it's a little bit. So assume it's B and most linear times log new to the D minus two log log log, log new to the square. <clears throat> so the situation is similar here. Up to this new log new term. It's only off now by a log log new factor. And when d equals to two, this vanish, right? You're only off by, so the lower bound is, is new. And here we off by this log of log new factor, square factor. This is for R2. All right, this is all I want to say about um, this application of your worth. So let's move on to the next part. Um, what is the next part? Let me see. The next part is, ah, okay. Let's do a simple one. The Well, this is not simple, but we will see a weaker results. This sunflower. Sunflower, the sunflower we introduced uh, in the literature before, people also call it delta system. Okay, so let's just, I will stick with saying uh, sunflower. It's the same thing, delta system, sunflower. What is it? Let's look at this definition. It's basically a collection of sets. With pairwise intersection identical. All the pairs of sets, their, their intersection is one same set. Definition. So again, it's a set system. Um, let R be a natural number. Um, a sunflower or delta system. A sunflower with um, kernel K and R petals is what is this? Is a set system. It's a collection of sets F one 
let's call it S. S1, S2, dot, dot, dot. SR, you have R pedals, um, such that a collection of R sets such that for any distinct ij in r si intersect sj are the same kernel k all right we call si minus k minus the kernel the petals The petals here's a picture so an important remark I write in red is note that the kernel K could be empty sets. That's allowed. So here's an example. I will draw two. You have K, which is now empty. And you have, this is your, oops. This is S1. S2. S3. Let's draw five. Uh, what color? This is when k is now empty. All the pairwise intersection is the same. Any two sets you take, their intersection is this middle part, the kernel. If k is empty, they're just a matching pairwise disjoint. All right. So here is if k is empty, another example, you just look like this, very simple r equal to 3. Here, k is non-empty, r equal to 5. The result we will see is a very classical result of Erdős and Rado, which basically saying, if you look at a uniform hypergraph or a, sets, a collection of sets of the same cardinality, provided that this system of sets, there are enough sets, then we can always find a large regular substructure, which is the sunflower here. So maybe I'll say one word that's why this sunflower is important. It has applications in, in many different parts of theoretical computer science. I will not talk about those. Um, I will just talk about how to find uh, a large sunflower. So sunflower has many applications in theoretical computer science. Okay, they just oh. so theorem. Erdős Rado is saying that if a collection 
of k sets, sets of size k, is large enough, then we can find the large sunflower. It's unavoidable, basically. So, theorem, Erdős and Rado, for any k, at least one natural number, and for any f, which is a system of k sets. So the elements in f are sets of size k. Um, if the number of sets in f, the cardinality of f is strictly bigger than k factorial times r minus 1 k to the power of k, then there exists a sunflower with r petals. Yeah, then you can find sunflowers like these or when k is empty like that as long as there are enough enough sets in the set system one key thing is that the ground set does not play a role a role here so the ground set could be as large as you want all we care about is how many sets in this system So note that ground set, size of ground set does not play a role below. Okay. So let's prove this one. The proof is by induction on um on what on on um k induction on k induction on k so the base case k equal to one what do we need to prove f when k equal to 1, f is a set of um, singletons, singleton sets, All right? k is just one set, so it's a bunch of singletons. How many singletons? 1 factorial, forget about it. 1, yeah, forget about it. So strictly bigger than r minus 1. So a set of at least R singletons. Okay, if you have R singletons, um, these singletons are pairwise disjoint. So view each one as the petals in the sunflower with empty kernel, we are done. You get the sunflower. All right. So R singleton a sunflower with empty kernel and R petals. And we are happy. Base case done. Simple. Inductive step. So assume it's true for k equal to 1, 2, 3, until k minus 1. Let's prove it for k. Um, OK, so the idea is we're going to look for a transversal of this such system. Let's first take the maximum size matching. Consider
maximum matching of f say this matching is we have edges um e1 e2 dot dot to em you have m edges in the matching let me draw this picture maximum matching the first observation is that m is at most we may assume r minus one may assume m is at most r minus one for otherwise if you have r sets pairwise disjoint this is again a sunflower with empty kernel and r petals and we are done otherwise Sunflower, blah, 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 I will not write it. So at most R minus one of them. Second of all, because of this maximality, union of these vertices in the matching is a transversal. Maximality implies the union of EI, I in M, let's call it T, is a transversal. of f, i.e. for any set, other sets f in f, f into set t is non-empty. Huh? Any other set must touch one of these points in the EI. For otherwise, you can add one more edge to the matching. You get a larger matching, contradicting to maximality. All right, so we get a bounded size transversal. T is of size <clears throat> M sets. Each set is of size. We are K, K set systems. Size K, which is at most R minus one times K. M is at most R minus one. Now, since all the edges touch one of these points, by pigeonhole, one of the points lies in many, many edges. So pigeonhole implies that is this the point in T? Is this the point X in T? Let's draw it. You have some X such that there are many, many sets going through X, such that the number of sets in F containing X is at least size of F over size of T which we know this is bigger than, F is bigger than what's the bound we want to prove? This bounds. Over T is at most R minus one times K. So this is equals to K minus one factorial r minus 1, k minus 1. Well, very nice. We can use the induction hypothesis. Implies, let's call this collection fx. Yeah, the collection of all sets in f containing x. This implies that fx as a, which is a collection of A minus one set, not quite, right? So I need to modify a little bit. Let's call it F prime. I define it to be F 
minus x for every f in f x. Yeah, since all the those in here they contain x, so let's just remove this guy from all these sets, and the remaining one has size k minus one. I call it f prime. It's a collection of k minus one sets. Same cardinality as f, right? You have at least this many sets. Obviously, um, now induction hypothesis on f prime uh, contains a sunflower. with our petals. And some kernel K. Then you pull back to look at the, the sunflower in the original FX. It's also a sunflower, just that all the sunflower in the, in the kernel, you have one more element X, which with our petal and kernel K say, right? And this gives a sunflower with our petals and kernel K union X in F. We are done. Any question? I think I'll stop here today.